Hi Jenny. Bom dia. Ah, bom <laughs> dia. <laughs> so today my guest is Jenny Leung. She's the master of Choi Kan Yao College and affiliated with the State Key Lab of Internet of Things for Smart City at the University of Macau. Her main research interests are combinatorial optimization, transportation logistics, and OR. When she was working in Hong Kong, she has collaborated with local companies on projects involving workforce scheduling, facility layout, and public transit planning. She has been invited as plenary speaker at major international conferences and serves on the editorial boards of the leading journals in her field. In 2014, Jenny was elected a fellow of the Shared Institute of Logistics and Transport and appointed to the Hong Kong Logistics Development Council. In 2020, she was elected an Informs Fellow and she'll serve as president of iForce for 2022 until 2024. In her spare time, she enjoys rowing, hiking, and traveling, having visited all seven continents. So Jenny, thank you so much for accepting the invitation. I'm so happy that you're here. How are you? Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this. Uh, I'm honored to join all the other illustrious uh, OR researchers that you have interviewed. Uh, Come on. So I'm forward to checking with, chatting with you. Yeah. yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, so you were born and raised in Hong Kong? Yes. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, my parents uh, actually uh, came from China. Uh, my parents were born in the 1920s and 30s. So they were uh, living through very uh, difficult war years. Uh, and, you know, eventually they came uh, to uh, Hong Kong in their early 20s, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so they were escaping from the Civil War? against Japan, uh, right? Civil War and the uh, Second World War, you know, with Japan. Yeah. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. They did not have formal schooling. Uh, That's right. So because they were growing up during these war years, they didn't have formal schoolings. And so I don't think either of them finished even primary school. So they were basically self-educated. So I think consequently, my, my father, my parents really value education. Uh, and my father actually promised uh, not just his children, but all uh, his siblings' children, all my cousins, that if any of us got into university, that he would support us, uh, no matter what. Uh, and he, he actually had a difficult life because he came to Hong Kong almost with nothing, um, but decided to start up a plastics business and did very well. But like I said, because he had no uh, formal education, so he worked very hard to learn everything. You know, he, I know he studied chemistry on his own at night, and actually he was trying to learn English. Uh, and, and then I discovered he was actually taking my primary school English books and using them for himself to, to learn English. So wow. that was... Uh, quite an inspiration, I think. For, yeah. Uh, and you have actually uh, four siblings and three of them are girls. That's right. I have, uh, I'm the middle child. I have two older sisters, one younger sister and a brother much younger than all, all four of us. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you, you told your father uh, started a plastic manufacturing business um, and he thought it was important to, for one to be educated in English. Uh, yes. <laughs> Yes, so, so you know, I guess when he started to be doing business, he had an idea that English is very important, you know, for the world, for communicating. So he uh, made sure that uh, he sent us to an English speaking school. So I was sent to an English speaking school in from primary one. In fact, it was a missionary school run by Italian nuns of the Kenosin order. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, and and I guess I'll say something about my my name <laughs> because of that. So the the night before I started primary one, my father called me and says, "Okay, now that you're going to English school, you should have an English name." 
Um, so your English name is Jenny, and he wrote it down, and he said, be sure to write this down on your school books, you know, from tomorrow onwards. So all of a sudden, I have a, a different name. Um, so I think it was years later that I realized Jenny, spelled with an A, is not a common uh, English name. Mm -hmm. So perhaps he either he made a mistake or I copied it wrong. I think he probably meant to call me Jenny, J-E-N-N-Y. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it's it's good to have a slightly different name and. Uh, it's only embarrassing later when people ask me, so what does Jenny mean in Chinese? <laughs> <laughs> because it had no Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> so what was your original name? Uh, my uh, Chinese name is Mei Yi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it took, for you, it took some time for you to get used to the new name? And... Um, yeah, well, I just have to remember it from day one when I went to school, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what was the first sentence you learned in English? Okay, so this is in connection with going to an English-speaking school. Uh, so the teacher was not a Chinese teacher, so she didn't speak any Chinese. So on the first day, uh, that morning, one of the Chinese nuns came into the class and said, uh, I have to teach you a very important English sentence, so be sure to remember it to the class. So I learned this first English sentence as a full sentence, which was, please may I go to the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> said, very important no, sentence, actually. And you need it. Make sure you raise your hand and say that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, wow. And then somehow, you know, it was all English and I don't remember what she said, but after a few months, we begin to understand what she was saying in English. Yeah, how yes. old were you? Uh, I was uh, six, yeah, oh. six years old. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, your first teacher was actually an Indian lady. My first teacher was actually an Indian lady from Goa, mm -hmm. so there's a connection with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Professor Nelson Makulam who was here as a guest. He also had a very uh, important teacher in school from Goa. So yeah. Yeah. That, that's very interesting, actually. Uh, and what were your main subjects in school? Uh, well, you know, I, in, in school, I like all the subjects. You know, I like science, I like geography, I like... So, so actually in high school in Hong Kong, we had to choose between the art stream and the science stream. And me and one other friend, my best friend, we didn't want to choose, we refused to choose. So for, for a couple of years in high school, we sat in on both streams classes. We would just skip out on one and go to the other. But eventually when we had to take the uh, high school um, government exam, you know, the, the, then you know, the school says we are not going to apply for 10 subjects for you. You can only apply for eight subjects. So we had to choose. So my best friend chose arts and I chose science. So I enter, ended up in science. Yeah. <laughs> so. you, you stay in touch with this friend, right? Yes, yes, yes. We're still very good friends. Yes. Yeah. So she's a lawyer in Hong Kong and uh, and we always talk, discuss about, you know, sort of arts and science really not different because we both uh, have to use logical thinking. So it's just a different language. You know, mathematics yeah. is just a different language and, you know, legal terms is just a different language. And we often discuss, you know, about our work and how the uh, sort of the analytical part of our work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that your parents uh, gave you complete support in terms of education. Uh, what about uh, the other family members? Uh, did they have a similar attitude? Uh, well, that's uh, not true. So actually at that time, you know, I guess many families whose finances were limited, they would only send the sons go to, on to university, but not, not the daughters, or even not uh, high school. So one time I had an uncle who was a little drunk at the time, who had appointed to me as uh, girls and says, there's no need for sending women to school because they'll just be married off anyway. And my father very kindly defended 
uh, me actually, but she is saying, well, you know, it's okay for her to go to high school because she got a scholarship anyway, <laughs> so I didn't have to pay for it, you know, but I think she, he was really defending uh, all of us. And like I said, he was very keen on education and he w willingly spent money to send all of us uh, to university. Yeah. Yeah. But did you confront uh, that uncle or you, you stayed quiet and mad? I, I, I was held back by my father. I would have confronted him, but I was held <laughs> back by my father. <laughs> yeah, it's not easy to hear something like that. Yeah, yeah well, but, you know. Yeah, your dad but then had, now, mm. now that I've learned, there are many ways to actually confront uh, such prejudice. And, you know, hard confrontation is only one way, but sometimes may not be the best way. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, you you did not stay in Hong Kong uh, for university. you know university. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Why? There, well, there were several reasons. One, there were only two universities in Hong Kong. It was incredibly hard to get into. You have to be in the top half percent or something, and I wasn't that good. Two, in if I went to Hong Kong University, it was a British style university, so you only need so you only do one subject, you know, at university. Really? And I. As, yeah, as usual, wanted to learn more. You know? uh -huh. So, so, so I wanted. I said I want to go to the university where I can take more than just one subject. So that's actually why I decided I want to go to the United States for for university. Yeah, I mean, and, your dad should have saved a lot of money to send you to to study in the U.S. Not only you, your your uh, sisters too. <laughs> Yes, yes, but he promised. So I, 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 like I said, I'm very grateful because I know it was not easy for him, you know, to to run the business and and to to have the burden to pay for our education. But he did, uh, and and all our cousins' education as well. Yeah. Wow, I mean, so <laughs> all the 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 your, yourself and your sisters, your three sisters, you all went yes. to the U.S. Uh, and did you apply to many universities uh, when trying to, to go to the U.S.? Well, I, I actually applied to nine, I think, and I got in. Uh, so uh, I got into both uh, Yale and Harvard, actually. Well, wow. actually, I applied, to, I applied to Radcliffe you know, at that time. You applied to Radcliffe, but you end up with a Harvard degree. So I will say no more about that because <laughs> <it's too laughs> Okay. <common. laughs> um, Anyway, so uh, I was thrilled because it's not so easy to get into. And, uh, uh, and then when I got there, there were only two students from Hong Kong. Uh, one was a senior and there was me. Uh, and it was wonderful because it was exactly what I wanted. The course catalog, the book of co available courses was about you know, two, uh, an inch thick and there was you know, hundreds of courses that one can take. So I was very happy taking courses in many, many different departments, I think 17 different departments, and I learned a lot. So it was a really uh, eye-opening, but really wonderful experience. 17? <laughs> the different, you know, philosophy, geography, you know, chemistry, biology, mathematics, uh, you know, history, you know, everything. Uh, wow. <laughs> so the difficulty comes uh, come time to choosing a major uh, because I, you know, I I know, I yeah, I have to take classes from seventeen. Everything, yeah. you know. So, but then I was thinking, you know, I want to do something, you know, with impact. Actually, when I first went to Harvard, I wanted to do environmental science. But when I got there, I discovered there was no such major. They don't offer that major. So I ended up trying to look for something else, took all these courses. Um, but when I was thinking about the major, I met uh, one of the upperclassmen. And I should mention him by name. Uh, because he really helped me a lot. His name was Brian Leverage. I think he now lives in California. So Brian, wherever you are, thank you very much for <laughs> changing my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
because he was very unusual uh, while everyone else was like wearing tie-dye t-shirts he was relatively properly dressed he was tech from texas he would wear his texan boots uh but uh, and a big belt with a big buckle and uh but he always carry a briefcase which was kind of an unusual combination when you see him <laughs> and we talk about you know what he was doing he was working part-time for companies math and to, you know, uh, to management and planning problems for companies and it was really interesting and you know since i like math i should really look into this and he recommended that I take this course called Decision and Control at Harvard. It was sort of a strange name. I didn't know what it was. And so, but I took his advice and I went to the class. <laughs> and turns out the textbook was Hillier and Lieberman, Introduction to Operations Yeah, Research. classical reference. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, yeah. I don't know why at Harvard they always have strange names for things. It was called decision and control, and they don't call it introduction to operations research. But I, I when I took that course, I thought, wow, this was fabulous. You know, this is the way to use math in an interesting way and used to solve actually real many real problems, organizational problems. Um, so I thought this is great. You know, I, I want to do this and. I took the, the two decision and control courses <laughs> available at that time, um, and uh, and I wanted to do this. Um, so so I ended up uh, after you know wandering around history and philosophy and all this English and all this, um, graduating with a degree in applied math, Apple Math as it's called, mm -hmm. because it had the fewest course requirements. And it was getting rather late in my junior year to mm -hmm. decide on a major at that time. Yeah. Yeah. On top of the 17 courses or something like that, you too, you also had interest in sports. Oh, uh, so uh, when I got to university, I wanted to join a sports team, but then I realized everyone else were much better sportsmen in all the sports that I know of. Um, so I decided to pick a sport that is very not so well known, uh, <laughs> which was uh, rowing crew. Yeah. So I joined the women's crew team. <laughs> yeah, and I, I was relatively small, and so everybody thought I was a cox, but then I insisted I wanted to be a rower, so I was a bow rower. Yeah, it was yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. It's uh, very good training. Yeah. <laughs> Physically and mentally. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you still uh, practice rowing to this day? No, 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 no. But I, I kept I, I kept up. Uh, and then actually when I uh, visited uh, Cambridge in 2008, I tried to join the college crew team as well. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you have any part time job? Um, well, I, I couldn't work outside of the university because of being on a student visa. Um, so I work mostly uh, 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 on campus. Um, so I, I was uh, I worked at the university at the science library. Uh, so that's good because I met a lot of mm -hmm. nice people there. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually worked as a teaching as a fellow teaching fellow for the introductory pre-calculus course. So oh. that was actually also very good, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then when you graduated, you also had a uh, lack of opportunity for the same reason. Yeah, for the same reason. So uh, I, I really, after taking all these uh, operational research courses, I really wanted to, to work, uh, and but it was not possible with the visa situation uh, that, you know, you, you, you want, in, I think at that time in the U.S., if any company wanted to hire a non-U.S. person, they have to prove that there's no U.S. citizen qualified for the job. So as a bachelor's degree holder, that was not possible. So the only option was to study more. <laughs> uh, and at that time, so I wanted to study more uh, operations research. and. Uh, 
um, when I was thinking about that. So again, I have to thank uh, Deborah Hughes Hallett, who was kind of my mentor at Harvard. She was a, a instructor uh, at the math department, but uh, uh, she was originally from uh, England. Uh, mm -hmm. And she said, well, you should go to uh, Oxford or Cambridge because there is very free. You can sit in any class and it's not many requirements because some parts of math you know well and other parts you don't well, so you should go. So I took her advice and I applied to uh, uh, Oxford and I got into Morgan College. Wow. Yeah. To do a second bachelor's degree. Yeah. It's not... So thanks to my dad again. He supported <laughs> me. <laughs> it's not every day you, you, you find someone with. Uh... Two undergraduate yeah. degrees, one from Harvard, another one from Oxford. That's very, yeah. very impressive. So Austin was a, was a very good experience because like, uh, as uh, Deborah Hughes Hallett said, it was very free. I could go to all the lectures. And uh, also you have a one-on-one -on -one tutorial with the professor uh, where you can just discuss. Uh, he, was, he was fantastic. He was actually, turns out he was a actually very famous uh, number theorist. Uh, Roger Heath Brown, and he didn't prepare. I did. I can just walk in and ask him any questions on any math topic, and he was able to answer. It was rather intimidating, actually. Yeah, like an oracle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but I think through watching him answer, I really learned how how to think about research and how to do. So it was turns out a second bachelor was a much better preparation for the later research, uh, uh, doing a PhD than if I took a course-based kind of master's program. So I, I am very grateful for what I was able to learn at, yeah. at Oxford. So you went to Oxford, yeah. this time uh, focused in on a particular subject. Uh, yeah. you, you got your degree in, in pure math this time? Uh, yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you got interviewed for a position? Uh, um, yes, yeah, so the same thing. I uh, actually, I, you were, you were, you were, you got the position. In fact, in theory, but you're not allowed theory. to 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 be hired. So, so the two years to confirm, I really like operations research, operational research, and I think I really wanted to work for a company to do projects. Uh, so I got interviewed by Logica, which was a well-known firm in London at the time, and uh, uh, got went to London, got interview, met the managers in the group, and they were very happy with me and said, you know, we look forward to you joining the group. Um, we'll just send the information to our HR department. And then I got the letter back from the human resources department, sorry, because again, because of visa situation, we cannot hire you. Wow. So, <laughs> so then again, my only recourse is to study more. <laughs> yeah. So you stayed so, in the UK or you, you changed countries again? <laughs> so I, I, I now at that point, I was definitely wanting to do operations research. So I applied to two pro PhD programs in the UK. University of uh, Sussex and Lancaster University, which was the two well-known operations research uh, programs at the time. And I applied to MIT and Stanford. So, wow, you, you just aim, you know, the top ones, right? <laughs> Always. Well, you know, it's worth a try. You don't get in if you don't try, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's so, fantastic. So where did you go? I, I went to MIT. I thought they would give me a little bit more uh, support. <laughs> yeah, that was a, probably a good choice, you know. Yeah. <laughs> wow, fantastic. Uh, so there you were, starting a PhD at MIT. Uh, yeah. We're talking about early 80s or so? Uh, yes. <laughs> right. Uh, mm -hmm. So what topic did you pick or uh, the topic was given to you and who was your advisor? Uh -huh. No, my advisor was Tom McNanty, and he was an extremely gracious and helpful advisor. And he said, you can do any topic that you want. Uh, so, so I looked around and, and my topic, actually, when I wrote the application, I wrote about stochastic processes. <laughs> but when I 
got there, I decided that actually I don't like uh, probability as much, and I really like uh, combinatorial optimization more. And and I guess looking back, actually, I I, I have to uh, thank my my mother for inspiration. My, Your mom? <laughs> my mother. My mother is uh, you know she didn't really have an education. Uh, but she was an excellent seamstress. And oh. when we were young, she would make uh, uh, all our clothes. And she was uh, extremely frugal, and we didn't have a lot of money growing up. But that she somehow can make the dresses with much fewer material than was standard at that time. So she was able to fit all these pieces of patterns uh -huh. using the least amount of wastage. So I felt, you know, it's like, you know, when I learned combinatorial optimization and I learned about packing problems, like she was doing the nonlinear version of the packing problem or the nonlinear version of the cutting stock problem. And I thought, wow, you know, that's, you know, what my mother doing was great. And that's why also this topic is so wonderful because, you know, it is difficult. It's fascinating. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. Great. And I, I wish, I wish actually she knew, because I actually remember when I finished my PhD, I had my slides, uh, and I, I, my, was visiting, my brother was visiting, and, and I thought, well, I'd like to try to tell her what my research was about, because it kind of relates with what she does, and, and I realized I couldn't really explain to her. But I wish she knew that she was doing such, you know, high level combinatorial optimization <laughs> problems. Absolutely. <laughs> wow. Fantastic. That, that uh, she knew how ability she had, you know. So. Right. Uh, you you also studied network flow problems and you got involved with the project with UPS, right? Yes, that's right. So my 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 PhD thesis was in two parts. One part was on polyhedral combinatorics, finding facets for the plant location problem. And the other part was uh, due to a project with UPS, planning their uh, delivery routes uh, and so on. So, well, so you had the, a, a theoretical emphasis um, and, and, yes. and a practical emphasis. That's right, that's right, that's right. That's so right. experimented both worlds, so... Uh, I'm going to show my pieces. Ah, <laughs> that's, that's so nice. <laughs> Great. Uh, so, uh, I mean, what was the project with, with the UPS about? Uh, so UPS at that time, they had a rule that they don't want their drivers to stay overnight away from home. So they always had the route, the driver's routes have to always return. Uh, and they, so they have a network of routes across the country. So the, the problem was given the origin destination demands of the packages, uh, how many trucks to send and what routes to connect um, so that they can deliver the packages uh, overnight on time. So how did you solve the problem? Uh, it was basically a mixed integer <laughs> programming problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we derived uh, some, uh, uh, so it's a Lagrangian relaxation, uh, but we dualize uh, not the usual uh, 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 constraints, but the the fixed charge constraints, oh. and, and try to solve it. And we set up. Uh, 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 we also try to program it for them. So that was very interesting. Yeah. So it this is what's discovered when you work with companies. They will tell you the problem, and initially they'll say, "Oh, we have all these rules." Uh, and then we would develop a model for them. And, uh, and then they would say, uh, and then when we actually get the data from them, you realize that in practice, they break a lot of their own rules. Yeah. So we have to Very <laughs> typical. <figure. Yeah. laughs> so we had to figure them out. Actually, when we kind of quick finished that project and we did, um, did uh, our initial presentation, I was extremely nervous because uh, we actually their their program uh, their um, managers did quite well uh, and we were only able to improve by like uh, less than one percent <laughs> so, so I thought oh no you know I'll never graduate less than one <laughs> percent not, not good enough you know 
And so we presented to them, but I said, this is a new way and you know, you can compute it a lot faster than what your managers can do. And then the manager that we were working with at UPS says, oh, no, no, don't worry. Less than 1% is already millions of dollars each year. So, you know, even that is, is really good. So we were, we, I, was, I was reassured, yes. Yeah. And what about the theoretical part of your work? Uh, so were you playing with facets, uh, valid inequalities? Yeah, yeah. So, so facets were sort of just coming into fashion <laughs> at that time uh, uh, as the new way of, uh, you know, incorporating into a branch and BAM. So what you had to do was to, uh, so there are people working on general facets for general energy programming, mm -hmm. but one trend was to look at specialized facets for specialized problems. So uh, I was looking at the uh, capacitated plant location problem. Uh, so, and I've since done some other work on other facets, but this was, I, I love working on, on facets and polyhedral combinatorics because when, when you think about it, uh, it's uh, um, sort of geometrical. You have to yeah. kind of visualize uh, uh, the, the problem geometrically, but when you actually go down to proving it, it's all algebraic, you know, linear algebra and, and actually yeah. know, algebraic, you know, yeah. listing the extreme points. So you kind of have to use kind of two different ways of thinking about the, the problem. So I actually work with my colleague at Yale, John Lee, uh, a bit on some of these, and he thinks all algebraically, and I think a little bit more geometrically. So when we have come upon a problem and we both thought that something was true, then we are pretty sure because he would come up with a more algebraic proof and I would come up with a more geometrical argument. Yeah, so, so that, was, that was very good. Yeah. yeah. That's that's very interesting. Uh, did you get to implement those uh, valid inequalities, or it was just a theoretical work? Uh, for the plant location, it was just a theoretical work, but uh, just much theoretical. <laughs> 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 well, but but I think you know, uh, I I think there were lots of other researchers working on on facets at that time, and a lot of the the facets for like set packing. Mm -hmm. and so on were, were actually now well incorporated into all the commercial solvers yeah programming now yeah okay. you mentioned you you developed a mixed integer programming uh to solve the ups problem and you had to code that and uh yeah. probably you use yeah. fortran uh, uh i actually don't remember i think <laughs> i i think it was fortran uh at, at that time, but but we, we it wasn't we weren't you know we weren't using carts anymore. It was just a, a, a you know, program. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so during that period, you also had the chance to to get to know some important names. Uh, for example, uh, Professor Margaret Brando, uh, which oh, by the way was a uh, was here as a guest recently. <laughs> you met her yeah, there. Yeah. So so when I first got to MIT, I think Margaret had just graduated and she was maybe working in Boston for a year. Um, so, uh, you know, it was, it was really great to meet her. I mean, I remember she was uh, really kind of uh, uh, tough and, and forthright and, you know, unafraid of anything charging forward. So, so I think for, and being one of the early uh, you know, pioneer, women pioneers in OR, I think she was a role model for a lot of uh, women in, in OR, you know, that one should just, you know, charge ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and do what one should do, yes. Were yeah. there any uh, female students uh, doing PhD in OR in your days? Uh, and my, so my, my year at the Operational Research Center were just three PhD students. Oh. So, so 33 and a third percent was not bad, actually. So, <laughs> yeah, if you put it like that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, um, there was, uh, uh, ahead of me, there was uh, Jan Hammond, who is now a Harvard Business School professor. Oh. And behind me was uh, Leslie Hall, who was at Johns Hopkins for a while, but I think she left academia. And Janet Wagner, who was at UMass uh, University of Massachusetts at that time. Yeah. So there was always, it was never zero each year. 
but it was not a high number. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see. Uh, yeah. You attended your first conference in Texas. So there are uh, Texas I, again in your life, right? Uh, that's right. <laughs> and that's right. That's you presented right. a work yeah. there that was uh, sort of an interesting experience. Yeah, so it was uh, my, I think my third year in PhD studies. Uh, and um, uh, I, I presented this work on the capacitated uh, plant location problem and the facets. Uh, so I was extremely nervous. Um, it was uh, scheduled for Tuesday afternoon uh, of the three day conference. So I think I didn't go anywhere that Monday. I was just in my hotel room practicing and practicing until I gave the talk on Tuesday afternoon. And then I can relax and enjoy the conference. But I thought it was great, you know, as a poor PhD student to get to go to this conference and meet all these names that I had read about, you know, whose papers that I had read uh, and all expenses paid, you know, they pay for my airplane, they pay for my hotel, they even pay for my food, which, you know, if I were back uh, at in, in Cambridge, I would have to pay myself, right? Yeah. But if I went to the conference, they pay for my food. So that was very good, I thought, yes. Yeah, and uh, you, you presented with uh, transparency and... Uh... Yeah, yeah, so especially in, in talking about facets, you know, you had to talk about cutting off the parts of the linear feasible region, but infeasible for the engine program. So it was one transparency overlay on top of the other. Um, so I, I miss those days. Actually, I don't, I think it's more interesting than, uh, so you, <laughs> than uh, for PowerPoint currently, yes. So you put a cut, each cut was a... Yes, a yes. And you had to plan so that you make your statements, you know, as you tell the story, you know, yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually impressed that you still remember it was a Tuesday uh, afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't that traumatic. <laughs> it was... Well, it was my first. It was my first ever presentation, so I remember it very well. Yeah, because Tuesday afternoon is actually my, what I did for my PhD, but I remember this. <laughs> you know. Yeah, because Tuesday afternoon is, is actually a, a famous song by the Moody Blues, so I <laughs> found that very interesting. You know. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yes, I right. should go listen to that song. Yeah, it's it's great song. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so. We talk about your first uh, conference and now your first journal paper, which actually appeared in Math Prague. Not bad. Yeah, no, I, I, I was very happy about that. Pretty well cited too. Yeah. And in fact, um, Professor Lawrence Woolsey was just writing his book on mixed energy programming and he put that result in his, in, in his book as well. So I thought I could, I could die and go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Yeah, yeah, I can only imagine uh, the, the feeling, you know, to, to be recognized yeah. like that. You know? uh, so after completing your PhD, you again could not find a job in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The same, same situation applies that if I were to work for a company, they had to prove that there were no U.S. citizens qualified for the job. Uh, but the only recourse was to go into academia because there they only need to prove that you were the best person for the job, which of course they wouldn't hire you if you weren't the best person for the job. <laughs> so that's, that was not difficult for the university. Sort of a self-explanatory in a way. <laughs> that's right. So, yeah. So, so, um, so my first job was at the School of Organization and Management at Yale. Because uh, I didn't want to be too far from Boston. You uh, applied only for Yale, or you applied elsewhere? I, I applied uh, elsewhere. Um, I, um, uh, but I, I at that point uh, I had boyfriends, so I wanted to be relatively close to Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yeah. So. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, I know. So I, I got. I think I got the job at Wharton as well. But yeah, I went to Yale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and you were mentioning you were, you worked with uh, uh, Professor John Lee, who is now the current editor in chief yeah. of Math Prague. Uh, that's right. Yeah. So that's right. 
So, so uh, there were, uh, it was a small group of operations research at the School of Biology Management. It was uh, headed by Professor Eric Donato, who is very famous for dynamic programming. Mm -hmm. uh, and the junior faculties were uh, Kurt Ann Stryker, who's now at the University of Iowa, former editor of math programming. Wow. <laughs> and John Lee. Uh, who's current editor of math programming. Uh, so we, we were a, a good, small, but tight group. Unfortunately, uh, the, the income, uh, a new dean came to the Yale School of Organization and Management, and he decided that uh, operations research did not fit in the school, and he uh, removed the group from the school. So we were temporarily a small department of operations research at Yale for a couple of years. And then we, uh, we were that given that was disbanded. And so we all went elsewhere. So Kurt went to Iowa. Uh, John went to, I believe, University of Kentucky math department, and I went to the University of Arizona. Oh. <laughs> well, at this stage, uh, you have experienced many shortcomings in your life but you always manage to find a way to overcome the difficulties. Uh, in your case, the same one over and over. <laughs> and so uh, what is the secret? Well, you know, I think one should always believe that, you know, there will always be opportunities. Whatever the situation, just choose the best option available and something will, will work out eventually. Uh, I think, you know, uh, my always wanting to work in industry to make a real impact uh, and not being able to be staying in academia. But I think looking back, looking back, I think uh, academia is a, is a great life <laughs> for me. <laughs> you know, because, you know, you get to do what you want. You got to choose what you do. You even get to choose what time you do it, you know, mostly, except for teaching classes. Uh, and because we're in the field of operation research, we can choose to work with companies and do projects that have real impact. Uh, in fact, one of my, the department chair, David Pingree at University of Arizona, when I was coming up for tenure, was saying, well, I seem to have done many different things, but, you know, maybe not very focused in one area. And he said, well, you know, don't worry, because when you look back, you will see that you, you will have traced a path. And I think he was right. I think for each one of us, we should just look forward and look for different opportunities and choose the one that you feel, you know, most connected to, you know, choose what you want to do every moment of, in time. And then eventually you will see that you would have created a path for yourself. Yeah, very, very nice piece of advice. So you mentioned you went to the University of Arizona, uh, mm -hmm. but did you apply elsewhere too, or that was uh, the only choice at the time? Uh, I think I, I applied to University of Seattle and University of Florida. Okay, so, so you like know, like, one, year, to... one year, one year. <laughs> I, you know, I guess I do cover the Torah of Tomatinga. I like extreme points. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I will come and visit you sometime because you are at the easternmost corner of South America. Absolutely, right? yeah. So I've been to the southernmost tip of South America, so I should come visit you in the easternmost tip. Of uh, you mean you were mentioning about extreme points, so, so you went south finally. To uh, Arizona. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and Arizona was very, very interesting, you know, sort of culturally and uh, uh, and also, um, you know, uh, I got in touch with sort of different types of companies. Uh, with Moshe Draw, my head at the time, we worked for a project on uh, a cattle ranch, uh, you know, looking at uh, delivering feed to the cattle. Uh, and so we would drive out at four in the morning, we'd drive out to the cattle range to, to observe their feed production. So that, that was uh, very, very interesting. And I also got uh, worked on a project uh, involving baseball scheduling when I was in Arizona. 
So this is <laughs> Professor Bob Russell was uh, visiting, and I think he chose Arizona because he is a big baseball fan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, Arizona Tucson was the spring training location for a lot of famous baseball teams. I don't know anything about baseball. <laughs> anyway, we, we got discussing and uh, we worked on a paper on um, uh, planning the, the ske tournament schedule for a baseball league. So that was a lot of fun. And apparently not so many people have worked on that. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sports scheduling is a very interesting uh, field. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now it became more popular, but I think uh, in those days, we're talking about 30 years ago or so, uh, yeah, there yeah. weren't many people working on that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you, you stayed there from 1991 to 1995 until you got yeah. a tenure uh, position. Yeah. So I got tenure and I thought, well, maybe it's time to take a break, a sabbatical and go home and spend some time with my mother. Um, so I took a leave and went back to Hong Kong. And then after two years, I decided to stay in Hong Kong because uh, in Hong Kong is a logistics hub of the world. And so there was a lot of interesting logistics problems to work on. And so I decided to stay. So I was at the Chinese University of Hong Kong at the time. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you're in uh, Arizona, uh, I visited the Grand Canyon in 1993 uh, and you were probably there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so, uh, so for, a, for a, a moment so in time, we were fairly, I mean, we were, we were close. <laughs> we, we, we might be very, very close because when I was in Tucson, I would go to the Grand Canyon very, very often, go camping and hiking there. Yeah. So yeah. we might have just passed each other. Why not? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I remember they know that was, there were the Native, Native Americans there mm -hmm. and uh, we ate some uh, uh, local dish uh, prepared mm -hmm. by them with pink lemonade. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. In Arizona, you know, there's pink lemonade and also everything is extra large. Uh, you know, a small soft drink is like a extra large soft <laughs> drink, you know, in other places. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I, I miss that. And I, I miss the, the Native American. It was very interesting to learn about the Native American culture. Uh, it was also interesting to have the wide open space and coming back to Hong Kong with the pollution and the clouds here, I often say I miss the blue sky and my friends in Hong Kong like look at me really strange. They don't understand this at all. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, so you went back to Hong Kong and you, when you moved was around 97 or so? It was just before 97, and so uh, it was interesting to actually go through the handover of Hong Kong from British rule to Chinese rule, and it's now over 20 years or so. Uh, but I, I say Hong Kong, uh, the life, life goes on, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and when you it's went my back, my parents, uh, actually, they traveled to Hong Kong in 97. <laughs> so they also could have probably... So we we witnessed the handover ceremony together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, uh, so there you were again uh, in Hong Kong, back to to uh, your roots. Uh, was it difficult to to adjust or to get used to to the you know place that you lived in your early years? I, I, I would say you know uh, sort of thanks to the internet and email I never felt sort of disconnected from the global operations research community uh, so uh, and in fact sometimes because sometimes like I'm the only person in Asia or Hong Kong that people know so you know I get involved in, in committees that way um, getting back to work at uh, the universities in Hong Kong, that was actually more the culture shock <laughs> because I never I never worked in Hong Kong. I was only a high school student yeah. in Hong Kong. And the business culture is actually slightly different. I think the professional or professional society culture is global, so that was no different. But getting to know kind of the university hierarchy or the working with business and and that I, I had to adjust a little bit. And oh. to 
a little bit not be as much an outspoken Western nice person, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. But but it was it was fun to work with uh, some of the companies. So um, so one project that I I like very much is uh, working with the uh, mass transit railway. Um, so it was just like a, a, a serendipity, I guess. I sat next to a person at some business lunch, and, and he was from the MTR. And I said, uh, "Do you have some kind of?" back burner project for one of my master's students to work on. And he talked about, well, what about synchronizing the transfer, you know, passenger transfer, because people get very crowded at the transfer stations at the MTR. Uh, and so one of my master's students uh, worked on this and, you know, it, it, and there we use the facets in practice. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> And there we use the facets that we developed in practice uh, into that uh, scheduling program uh, uh, for them. So, so, so that is uh, one of my relatively highly cited papers. Uh -huh. uh, so, and people are still working on this transfer problem these last 20 years or so. so that these last, uh, I guess, 15 years. Uh, so, so that was very good. I should also mention another project I did was with uh, 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 LSG Skyshops. This is the catering service for uh, Lufthansa and other airlines mm. at the Hong Kong airport. So we went out uh, and observed the operations every day and took a, a, a bunch of students out there. Did you have to wake up 4 a.m. in the morning too? No? Uh, this one's like 6 o'clock. Oh. So <laughs> So, but it was a very interesting, very complicated. I we didn't get a whole lot of papers out of that one, but I got one, which was uh, co-authored with one of your previous interviewees, Sin Ho. Oh so, yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, so we had a paper on um, the the part about uh, actually delivering the finished meals onto the tarmac to the different flights that need them. So Sin is an expert in, in uh, you know, taboo search and, and, and so on. Yeah. And, uh, and so she programmed up a really nice algorithm for that part. Uh, but the part about the kitchen, we had some results, but uh, we didn't write it up uh, with uh, planning the kitchen. Yeah, part. now that you mentioned Sin, <laughs> tell me how was the experience yeah. of working with her? Oh, Sin is fabulous. Sin, uh, <laughs> you know, she, this, uh, actually, one of my colleagues says, oh, this person sent a CV wanting to come work as a postdoc, and he already had enough postdocs, and he says, you might be interested. So I looked at it, and I said, okay. And then this lady, you know, actually, I looked at the CV. I didn't even know it was male or female. And <laughs> And this, <laughs> and she walked into my office, uh, and and she was such a, a a good researcher. You know, she's very meticulous. You know, she wouldn't let uh, even the tiniest mistake go un, unpunished. You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and 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 she she was she was just fabulous. The other thing is, she's such an interesting person, right? She yes. Uh, Parents are actually from Hong Kong, but she grew up, she was born in Sweden, grew up in Norway. And so, so this, this part when she- Yeah, she know, lived she, in the US, yeah. Canada, and yeah, then yeah, yeah. went to Hong yeah, Kong. Yeah, but in Hong Kong, she had a little difficulty because she looks completely Chinese. She speaks fluent Cantonese, but she, her reading of Chinese is not so fluent. And so when we go to restaurants, Hong Kong people are very impatient. People hand her the menu and she would take some time. And the waiter was like, you know, how long does it take to decide? But it's, it's, you know. Poor sin, come on. Poor sin, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I got the opportunity to interview her and I knew it was great. Uh, she's a, such an interesting person indeed. So during these 20 years you, you were in Hong Kong, uh, you mentioned this collaboration with the companies, but uh, what do you think were the most relevant research work, uh, you know, that uh, you, you did during this period? 
Um, so, so uh, I mentioned, and you know, I'm working working with the with the MTR. You know, so so I think uh, that work on uh, public transit planning uh, was very interesting, and I had continued some work on it. I also did some work, uh, like I said, with the uh, the uh, airline catering. I also did some work uh, with uh, a different part of the airport operations uh, on the cargo terminal, uh, on some of the plannings for storage and also uh, for uh, staffing. Uh, again, uh, they had crews that had to go out and collect uh, packages from the airlines and, and coming back. Uh, and uh, pretty much try to continue my work on uh, um, um, polyhedral combinatorics and continue to some, do some of the theoretical work. Uh, I actually continue to collaborate with John Lee, even though we were at different uh, continents. Uh, I, I had visited him briefly when he was working at I, IBM uh, and, and when he was in Belgium also. Uh, so we continue to work on uh, uh, sort of facets uh, for fixed charge problems of, of different types. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so was good. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, eventually you left Hong Kong. Uh, well, okay, so, so while I was doing sort of my regular thing as a researcher and professors uh, at the Chinese university, they also have a residential college system kind of like Oxford and Cambridge and uh, Harvard and, and Yale. Um, so through some you know strange coincidence, uh, they were trying to build uh, new colleges. Uh, when they switched the university from a three-year system to a four-year system, they decided to establish some new colleges. And I was uh, called in to uh, involve in the planning of these new colleges. Uh, so I became much more involved also in this residential college uh, education uh, while I was in my last uh, eight, seven or eight years uh, at Chinese University. Uh, and then Chinese University decided to build a new campus, in fact, a new university uh, across the border from Hong Kong in Shenzhen, and they want to establish uh, residential colleges there as well. So I was asked to be the head of one of the colleges there uh, and try to establish the residential college system at the Chinese University of Hong Kong Shenzhen. So I, I left Chinese University of Hong Kong, Hong Kong uh -huh. and went to Chinese University of Hong Kong Shenzhen uh, for a few years and tried to help to establish the residential colleges there. But what well. exactly uh, was your role in practice uh, when it comes to establishing those, uh, uh, so so um, we this so so the idea is uh, for the students to be a well-rounded, uh, educated person, knowing uh, expertise in your major subject area is not enough, but you also need sort of soft skills, learning how to deal with people, teamwork, leadership, and so on, and general education. So at the Chinese University in the residential college, we, uh, they, they have to take, to, in order to graduate, they have to take certain number of courses at the residential college, as opposed to your major uh, subjects. So you advise well. them to take 17? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So, so we actually devise rather difficult kind of sort of part uh, small group seminar classes and part uh, internship uh, volunteer projects that they had to do in the community uh, for them to get to know uh, sort of uh, uh, global events, global topics, uh, understanding about the community and learn how to work with people from different majors and different subjects. Uh, so when we built up, uh, and we also built it so that uh, they, it's fully residential. So we like in Oxford, we eat dinners together uh, we uh, encourage them to have a lot of uh, student self-governance, 
so I have to set up kind of the physical environments, you know, actually the physical building environments and the and the activities program and the courses uh, for for the residential. So a lot of administrative work in this case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, so I was a you know, I I was living on site. I was a dean of students and warden. But it was very good because the head, the master of the college at the Chinese University of Hong Kong was uh, a very famous uh, Nobel Prize winning economist from Oxford and Cambridge, Sir James Merlis. And while I think initially people thought he, would, he was being hired just as a figurehead, but he was extremely hands on. And I, I learned a lot actually about administration and uh, the purpose of a residential college, you know, as it was set up in, in Oxford and Cambridge. So that was uh, an extremely valuable experience. Yeah. Uh, and then you had this opportunity to join uh, the university in Macau, right? Mm -hmm. uh, very recently. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So so Macau also has a residential college. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was, I was uh, recruited. So I thought, well, why not join Macau? So, you know, and so there's you know, give me a chance to learn about yet a different uh, culture, uh, Portuguese Macanese culture, uh, and uh, so you know, it's it's also been been a very very good experience. Yeah, you yeah. greeted me with a beautiful bon dia, uh, <laughs> which means good morning. Uh, uh, how's your Portuguese? <laughs> that that this and the only other phrase I know is obrigada. <laughs> So, yeah, but, you know, I, I think, you know, with coming back to, to Hong Kong and Macau, again, you know, I think the university is very connected to the community here. Uh, so, so I look forward to, you know, I've only, you know, because of the um, pandemic, you know, I have not had a chance to actually get involved, but I look forward to that very much. I should actually mention in Hong Kong, you were asking me about my projects in Hong Kong. Actually, one project I did, and this is through the residential college, because again, at the residential college, not only students are from different majors, but the professors associated with it is from a different major. So one of the other professors was uh, Professor Colin Graham, who was the head of the emergency room at one of the hospitals in Hong Kong. And so again, just you know, through dinner talk, we say, well, let's work on the the you know planning and logistics of the emergency room. So that's actually been an ongoing project with him and one of my former students, well, students at that time, but now a professor at Hong Kong U, Professor Yong Hong Kuo. And we've been looking at various issues about uh, scheduling the doctors and uh, the layout of the emergency rooms and, and so on. So that's been an ongoing project as well. Yeah. yeah. Healthcare application actually never gets out of fashion. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. right. That's so right. Yeah. That's that's very good for you. Uh, so how is OR in Macau? Uh, OR is not very not not very much in Macau. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I would say uh, there, there's a lot uh, work for me to do to promote more OR in, in, in Macau. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. They, they need it. Uh, and the transportation system in particular here needs it. It's a very small place. It's a, it, it, you know, but there's a lot of traffic and, uh, you know, things are not, it couldn't, things could be better organized. Yeah. So there are <laughs> yeah. a lot of opportunities, you know, to, to, there's a lot of to city logistics yeah. and things yeah. like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so let's talk about WARMS now. Uh, okay. Uh, you were one of the founding members, correct? That's right, that's right, that's right, yeah. I'm, I'm very, uh, actually, I would say the, the real instigator is Professor Candy Yano from UC Berkeley, and uh, also one of her students, Carla Borland, who's from industry. Uh, and uh, we decided that you know there there were not very many women at that time uh in this is in the 1990s uh and uh and there perhaps uh you know the community didn't really understand some of the issues that and challenges women have to face so 
it's good to kind of uh, raise the, those in, in within the profession. And I remember, you know, even before Worms was officially formed, uh, we just wanted to have an opportunity at the, I think, Orsa Tim's conference at that time uh, to discuss, have a session at one of the conferences to discuss these issues. And we were told by the organizing committee that there was no room at oh. the conference for no no session, no no room to schedule such a such a session in the in the program. But you could use one of the rooms during the lunch break to have a brown bag lunch if you want. But be sure that if you move the chairs, that you put them back before the afternoon session start. Are you for real? And, <laughs> I, and this has stuck in my mind because I thought, don't they pay the hotel hundreds and thousands of dollars for the hotel staff to arrange the chairs? You know, why do us professors have to rearrange the chairs? <laughs> after uh, our, our, our meeting. So, so we really, really pushed for that. And at that time, we discovered actually that because there were so few women academics that some schools even did not have a maternity leave policy uh, and they didn't understand a lot of the challenges uh, for, uh, for child care that many women professors have to face. And I think to our efforts, we really have to raise the profile. So I would have to say, you know, single, particularly single parents, whether it's male single parent or female single parent, childcare is a major concern. But you know, predominantly childcare falls on women. So I, I think now the situation have improved very, very much uh, in terms of these explicit uh, sort of. Uh, prejudice with, you know, no understanding about childcare and uh, prejudice against women having the ability to be, uh, uh, academic, you, know, you know, good researchers uh, and good professors. I think a lot of the overt uh, barriers have been removed, uh, but perhaps still some underlying cultural and hidden barriers about women not being as visible as uh, we could be in the profession. Uh, and I think we are continually working on that. I was very gratified to hear one now famous uh, women professor say that her involvement with worms have really given her confidence and had helped her with her career. So we're, I'm happy that, that worms has made a contribution to women in the profession. Our little uh, lunch gathering, I think, started with about 10 or 12 people, have now grown into the standard Tuesday lunch, uh, Worms lunch, of over 200 people. Tuesday and afternoon, yeah. again. Tuesday <laughs> afternoon, yes. Uh, uh, and, and only limited 200 because of the size of the room. You know, we have many more women who, who want to join. So, so from I'm, 10 I'm very, to 200. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, the current president of uh, iForce is Gracia. Uh, mm -hmm. She was also here as a guest. Uh, mm -hmm. I like her very much. Uh, yeah. And uh, you are going to be the next president. So yes. uh, another female president. Uh, way to go. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I, 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 I should acknowledge Gracia. I think, you know, first, she's been a fantastic president of iForce. Uh, and she is uh, very insistent. So under her, iForce now has a, a diversity, equity, and inclusion mission statement. Uh, and she very much uh, pushed for every committee, every editorship that uh, a female candidate should be considered. You know, uh, and I think, uh, you know, thanks, thanks to her, you know, my name came up. <laughs> being the, the, the next president. Actually, I was nominated by the three previous uh, uh, past presidents, uh, um, Professor Michael Trick, mm -hmm. Professor Nelson McCullough, 
and and, and Dominic Tavera. So, uh, but but Gracia as current president also supported the nomination. So, so that was uh, very good. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, uh, this is very exciting. You you're going to be uh, the next I Force president. So, uh, what are the plans uh, for the future? Well, I certainly want to continue the uh, you know diversity, equity, and inclusion direction that Gracia has set. Um, I think you know uh, within I Force is a federation of uh, fifty national societies uh, across the world. Uh, I think I think Informs is the biggest one, mm -hmm. <laughs> and some of the others. But I think actually there's a lot of uh, interesting operational research done elsewhere in the world, and I think that we want to put push for sort of more communication and collaboration absolutely across the, across the different regions uh, and you know many people who are trained maybe in the US or, or Europe are now back in their home countries uh, or like you you know train in your local, local countries and I think if we share more and we all understand what each of us are doing we can give each other support and also spark uh, new research collaborations as well. Exactly. Uh, we're very much encouraging. Uh, so there's probably going to be a new uh, African region that is developing, uh, and 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 I really look for more sort of uh, uh, that. In some ways, is a form of uh, inclusion and encouraging diversity as well. Yeah. I think we should recognize uh, sometimes. People in sort of not the mainstream universities in the U.S. or Europe, um, they are actually doing very interesting work, and it's a matter of bringing attention to the interesting work that they are doing. And I hope to do that uh, more. That's uh, amazing, and I'm really pleased to hear that. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there are, you know, uh, social economical reasons uh, for uh, preventing one to travel and to attend conferences and you ended up somewhat uh, outside the circle uh, and as you mentioned uh, you don't be that much connected and people do not get to know you or you don't have to know about the work that has been developed maybe in Africa or even here in South America so I okay. think uh, uh, your attitude and your intentions mm -hmm. are really really uh, mm -hmm. fantastic and I hope you succeed in, you know, trying to bring the communities even more together. Yeah. Well, one, one big aspect of iForce is uh, uh, developing countries. You know, we want to bring, you know, sort of established researchers and connect them with projects in, in developing countries. So that's a, that's a big part. Uh, and, and I think we now have uh, global webinars. Uh, so uh, that's one way to also uh, connect uh, people from different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And we have a new journal on sustainability. So that's a new exciting area of research for operations research and analytics. And people from different regions have um, issues about sustainability and we can all bring different methodology to look at some of these these problems. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. I'm excited, I'm excited, yeah. yeah. So Jenny, uh, thank you so much uh for for being here i had a great time i know i laughed a lot <laughs> you know it was so much fun uh thank you so much well thank you thank you so much i really enjoy chatting with you and uh i you know thank you for you know le letting me wander in different parts uh, of the topics that that we had discussed so i'll finish with my other portuguese words obrigada <laughs> Excellent. De nada. You know, it's your welcome. <laughs> Thanks again, Jenny. It was a pleasure to have you here and I hope to, to see you soon. And please uh, feel very, very free to visit us here. Uh, we'll be, uh, we're nice hosts. So looking forward to, to meeting you soon. Okay. I look okay. forward to being able to visit you. Thank you so okay. much. So, oh, ciao. Bye. Ciao. <laughs> That's the third word. <laughs> no, <you're not. laughs> Bye. Ciao. Ciao.